to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Cast all your cares upon him. He cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7. We welcome you today to our study of the subject of prayer. Today we're going to be thinking about some specific laws of God that govern prayer, that help us to make prayer what God wanted it to be and for it to be effective in our lives. And so we're so glad that you joined us for our study today. We want you to know that our lessons are being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. We want to encourage you to check out the Lord's Church in your area. They meet on Sunday morning, maybe on Sunday night and Wednesday night as well. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about the souls of other men and women and who just simply want to go by what the Bible says. And friend, we hope you'll stop by and visit the Lord's Church in your area. As always, we want to encourage you if you don't have your Bible out and handy, get your Bible, let's get it ready as we're going to be looking to the Word of God on our subject of prayer today. And friend, as you're doing that, we also want to encourage to check out, I want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. It is a great tool for you to study along with your study of the Bible. It is a great tool for you to grow in your knowledge of God and His Word. And so check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access a good variety, a wide variety of Bible study tools. We've got written material, we've got audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, and it's all available free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of this series on prayer, or any and all of our past lessons, we'll make those available to you free of charge. Just go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, fill out a media request form. Uh, you can get an instant download of that immediately, or if you need it on DVD or CD, we can make that available to you as well. Just let us know when you fill out that form the best way, and we'd be happy to take care of that. And friend, won't you check out from the respective uh, stores in the Apple and Android stores, the Gospel of Christ app. Great way when everybody's pretty much got a smartphone today. It's a great way to study God's Word, get notifications, updates about new lessons that we're doing, and keep you up to date on all that information. And so check out our app for the Gospel of Christ as well. Today we're thinking about some specific laws that govern the subject of prayer that dictate how prayer is to be used, some things we have to set in order to understand prayer as God designed it. And just like with laws in a given state or country, if those are not followed, then we can't really be as effective in our prayer life as God designed us to be. And so what's the first law, dictate of God that governs prayer? Sometimes I hear people pray, and they may pray a beautiful prayer, but they just end that prayer by saying, Amen. Now, friend, in the Bible, prayer has to be in the name of Jesus by the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If I don't pray through Christ and by His authority, then I haven't kept the laws of God on prayer. Let me show you in the Bible. Three passages. Would you look in your Bible in the Gospel of John with me, please? Look in John chapter... We're going to look at three passages. One in John 14, one in John 15, and then one in John 16. The Bible teaches we must pray by the authority or in the name of Jesus. John 14, verse 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If, here's the condition, here's the law, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now turn over to John 15, verse number 16. 
Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now look at the final verse, John 16. I want you to look in verse 23 following. Jesus said, In that day you will ask me nothing, talking about after he's already gone, most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. These things I've spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I'll no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I'll tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I did not say that I shall pray to the Father for you. And Jesus goes on to tell them about that. But here we heard in three separate verses that if we're going to ask... It needs to be in the name of Jesus. Now, friend, let's ask this question. What does it mean to ask something in the name of Jesus? It is, is that phrase in Jesus' name some magical talisman that somehow makes it? That's not the idea. To do something in someone's name in the Bible, a couple of things are implied by that. Number one, to do something in someone's name means that we're doing it by their authority. Uh, Colossians 3.17 says this, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so we're to do everything by the name of the Lord Jesus. What are we talking about there? Acts 4 verse 7 helps us. They said to Peter and John, who had been boldly preaching the gospel and who had been brought before the Jewish leaders of that day, by what name or by what power have you done these things? To do something in the name of Jesus means that we do it by His power or His authority. You see, Matthew 28, 18 says, All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's currently sitting at the right hand of the Father he is the head of the church today, Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. And so when I pray in Jesus' name, I'm praying by His authority. When I pray in Jesus' name, I'm praying through Him as the Son of God, the mediator between man and God. Listen to 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. There is one mediator between man and God the man Christ Jesus himself. And so we're praying through Jesus as our mediator and by his authority and power. Now, when you think about praying in Jesus' name, someone will usually say a prayer and they'll close that prayer by saying, in Jesus' name, amen. But you know, you could begin the prayer just as well as closing it that way. You don't have to say that at the end. A person could say, God, we approach you today through the authority and power of your son, Jesus Christ. Friend, that's the same idea. We pray through Jesus in his name and by his authority. Am I saying one way is better than the other? That's not what we're saying. But we do need to pray in the name of, by the authority and power of our Lord Jesus Christ for prayer to be acceptable to Almighty God. Let's then think about another law that governs prayer according to the Scripture. For a prayer to be acceptable to God, to be heard by God, it must be prayed according to God's will and in line with the teaching of the Scripture. Uh, let me show you the verse. Look in your Bible in 1 John chapter 5. The Bible teaches that when we pray, God's will should be factored into all our prayers. 1 John 5 verse 14. The Bible says, Now this is the confidence that we have. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Lord, teach us to pray. Luke chapter 11 verse 1. And so, for it to be according to God's will, it has to factor not just what I want or what I think I need, but God's overall will. Seeking first the kingdom. 
Do, living a life that, that brings honor and glory to God. Helping others uh, come in contact with the gospel. God's ultimate plan to save mankind. You see, Jesus prayed in the garden in Matthew 26. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but thine be done. Was it God's will for that cup of suffering to pass over Jesus? No. Jesus had to go through that. That wasn't what God's design was, but listen to how Jesus ended that prayer. Not my will, but thine be done. Friend, we may, we may pray for things, we may ask things, we may want or need think we need things, but if we're always cognizant of and we always try to govern, o override our prayer with what God's will is, that's the right heart and attitude God wants us to have. And so I want to pray according to the Scripture. I don't want to go out and pray, God, help me win the lottery. God, this guy just had road rage against me. I want you to cause him to get in a wreck and show him how bad. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. We want to pray according to God's will, according to the Scripture, what the Bible teaches us to pray, and then factor the divine will of God into let everything be governed by the divine will of God. And so, not being selfish and praying according to Scripture is a big part of the law's governing prayer as well. Well, here's another one that the Bible teaches governs the subject of prayer. We need to pray in full confidence and faith that God is able to do what we ask. Here's the verse that teaches us that. James 1. I want you to look in your Bible in James chapter 1 with me, and we're going to read verses 5 through 8 together. I need full confidence and faith in God and His power. James says in James 1 verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in his ways. And so when I pray, when I ask for things, God, help me with the necessities of life. God, help me with gaining wisdom. Lord, help me to overcome this temptation. I'm not talking to an imaginary friend. I'm not just throwing that out there for whoever might hear it. I've got full confidence that not only does God hear, He is able to do abundant, listen to this, Ephesians 3.20. I've got full confidence He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or can even think. God's able to do more than I can even imagine. I've got faith that when I pray for wisdom, God is going to grant me to learn more, to grow more, and to know how to better serve Him. And so a law that also governs prayer is that I've got to have full conviction. In Our prayer cannot be, I hope God can do this. Maybe, uh, possibly, I don't know, but it's worth a try. No, that, that, no. Let him ask in faith, but no doubting. I've got full confidence in God and his word and his power and ability to help each and every one of us. All right. What's another law that definitely governs the idea of prayer? Prayer and seeking God in one's life are directly related. Would you open your Bible to Psalm 34 with me? I want you to look in Psalm 34, verse number 4. For my prayer life to be as effective as it can be, I've got to have a heart that is seeking after God. Look at verse number four. David is praying here, the Psalm of David. I sought the Lord, now watch the connection, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. David is already seeking God. The Bible teaches us we're to seek God's kingdom with all our heart. Matthew, or to seek first God's kingdom with all our heart. Matthew 6, God is to be our main priority in everything that we say and do. And so if I'm actively seeking after God, I'm chasing after God, I'm trying to 
find him and live a life that is acceptable to him, then God's going to hear my prayer. Listen to what God says later in that psalm. Listen to Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. To who? To those who are trying to seek God first and to find him with all their heart. That's the person whom God hears. It, we're trying to... Here's some other ways we'd put that. It's the person who loves the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and loves their neighbor as themselves. Mark 12, verses 30 and 30, 31 through 32. It's the person who's trying to walk in the light every day. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It's the person who's trying to bear fruit to God. John chapter 15, uh, one following. That's the person whom God hears. Now, friend, a man who, a person who's living in conflict with the will of God or, or someone who has sin in their heart and they know they're living in sin, that person's not going to be heard by God. How do we know that? I'm talking about somebody who's living in abject sin and rebellion to the will of God who knows they're living in sin and is going to keep living in it, and someone who knows what God's law says and is rebelling against that. God doesn't hear that person. Again, the Scripture teaches that. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. He who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Psalm 66, 18 Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. And so I want to do my best. I'm not saying, friend, we are not saying that you never mess up. We're not saying that we're perfect. We're not saying that we don't sin. We do. But we're trying to seek after God. We're trying to walk in the light. We're trying to keep sin at bay. We're trying to overcome Satan and temptation. And to the best of our ability, live the way God wants us to live every day. And then there is this law that governs prayer. We need to have a spirit of humility if our prayer is going to be acceptable to Almighty God. Uh, look in your Bible in Psalm chapter 9. I want you to open your Old Testament to Psalm chapter 9. I'm going to show you a couple of verses I think that teach this idea. Turn to Psalm chapter 9 and I want you to look at verse number 12. When God avenges blood, He remembers them. Watch this. He does not forget the cry of the humble. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. God, remember, God doesn't forget the cry of the humble people, those who are, have humility in their heart. And listen to what Solomon says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 as, they, as he prays to God and as he thinks about the people. Listen to 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. God says, If my people who are called by my name. Listen to this now. If they humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Everyone who exalts himself, Jesus said, will be humbled. He who humbles himself be exalted. Remember the, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector. One man prayed, God, look how good I am. God, I thank you. I'm not a bad person. One man prayed, God, I know I need you. Which one did Jesus hear? God here, the one who knew he needed God, not the one who was prideful. And so what, what do we mean when we say one of the laws that governs prayer is a spirit of humility? Here's what that means. It means that we have a heart that to the best of our ability in every way is devoid of pride, selfish interest, and selfishness. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I do not think more highly of myself than I ought to, but I want to put God on that top pedestal. What does it mean to say we've got a spirit of humility? Friend, it's a, it's a realization of man's inability, my inability to save myself and to help myself apart from God. Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Jeremiah said in the long ago, Jeremiah 10 verse 23, and thus we want to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lean, lean not on our own understanding. Proverbs 3 verse 5, there's a way that seems right, 
to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 16, verse 25. And then, a spirit of humility is a spirit that is according to God's will. Jesus prayed, not my will. You think about prayers of humility. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but thine be done. It's a willingness to hand matters over to God completely and let Him in His own way, in His own time, handle them. This is why we cast all our cares upon God, for He cares for us. And so today we think about some of the laws governing prayer. We think about how important that prayer life is. And friend, we want to emphasize to you just how much we need prayer life with God, how much in our everyday life we need to be a people of prayer. I wonder sometimes, look at James 4, I wonder if sometimes we don't have more help and receive more benefit from God just simply because we don't pray. Do you ever think in your life, maybe I'm missing out because I'm not utilizing all the tools I need to? Look at James 4 with me. Look in James chapter 4. I want us to emphasize and really see the importance of prayer. Look in James chapter 4. I want you to hear what James says about some in James chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. James says, You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your plate. Now back up to verse 2. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot contain. You fight and war. Now watch this. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. I wonder how many times in our life, I wonder how many times in my life, I haven't been as effective or successful or let the Lord's will be done in my life because I simply didn't ask. You do not have because you do not ask. If any of you ask, God says, I'll give it to you liberally and without reproach it will be given to him. James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And so <coughs> we emphasize the importance of prayer. We emphasize the, the power of prayer, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails or overcomes much. Prayer has the ability to overcome. Uh, Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not in temptation, deliver us from the evil one. There's a power in prayer that sometimes I think we just overlook. Prayer ushers me before the almighty throne of God. Listen to Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we may receive, obtain grace and mercy to help. There is help to be offered or had in time of need. How? Through the avenue of prayer. Prayer is such an important tool that I think sometimes we overlook that. You know, the passage that we mentioned, James 5, 16, the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. There's a little background to that that I'd like for you to see. Look in James chapter 5 with me. Who, who's James thinking about? And what's that got to do with us? Look at James chapter 5, and I want you to hear the background of that. Verses 17 following. As soon, directly after saying the fervent, effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, James then gives us an example. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gained rain, and the earth produced it's fruit. Uh, the example given is that of Elijah. And you remember the story. Elijah, the story of Mount Carmel, the prophet of Baal, and all that God did there. But I want you to hear this phrase. Elijah <clears throat> was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed. What's that phrase mean? Elijah received power and help from God. God did great things through Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed. God worked through Elijah's life, and God can work in my life and yours today as we pray, as we ask God for help, as we seek His will. Am I saying God's going to rain down fire from heaven on evil through Europe? That's not the idea. 
but I wonder if we don't limit the power of God in our own lives by not praying. Elijah, a man like me and you, and he prayed, and God worked great things in his life, and his will was done in part through the works of Elijah. God would have found another way if it hadn't. But what about my life and yours? Are we utilizing the power of prayer today? How much are you praying? Are you praying like you ought to? Do we really understand the importance and power of prayer? Friend, if you're not a child of God, we want to encourage you today based on so many benefits, but especially the fact that your sins can be forgiven, you can be in a right relationship with God, and you can have access to this avenue of prayer. Won't you become a Christian today? Do you believe what the Bible says, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Nobody comes to the Father except through Him, John 14, 6. Would you turn your life from a life of sin and turn it to God and give it to Him in repentance? Peter preached, repent and turn or be converted that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Would you confess Him as your Lord and Savior? Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father. And would you, to have your sin washed away, to get into Christ, be baptized? Here's what Peter said, very first gospel sermon. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. If you haven't done that today, Friend, we want to encourage you to do that. We're so glad that you joined us for our study on the subject of prayer. We want to encourage you again to check out the Lord's Church in your area and study with us next time as we're going to think more about the unsearchable riches of God and His divine Word. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.